Namaste and in la catch and welcome to this episode of One World in a New World. I'm your host Zen Benefiel and this week's guest is Maria Heller. She is a dynamic woman, a mouth that roars is what she's known as and she's been a podcaster for over 20 years and has been an old friend and still is actually a um, long time. Uh, she is one of the most interesting podcast hosts because she has all kinds of topics from politics, real news, great people, spiritual views, um, just about any topic that you can imagine. She's explored it and she's pretty ruthless in her questions too. <laughs> yeah. Glad to have you here. Thank it's you. Good for to be coming. here, Sam. Thanks for having me. Well, you know, in retrospect and, and looking back you know most all of my guests have had some kind of activity within themselves that gave them an idea that there's more to life than just what they see with their eyes and they've got some kind of an inner connection whether it be a voice visions dreams or those kinds of things and it happens at various ages as well some are very young and that is one of my psychiatrists had said to me, you know, most people to go through don't go through their spiritual awakening until their mid-40s if they ever do. Right. I have a feeling that you kind of had something happen oh. much earlier in life. <laughs> what was that like? My spiritual awakening was getting hit by a truck, literally. Uh, I was four years old. We were living in Brooklyn. Uh, I dropped my mother's hand while she was in the store and darted across the street and met a supersized big truck, which pounded me into the uh, pavement. I was out cold for who knows how long, um, almost lost my eye. So I had a patch on my eye for quite some time. Uh, but when I got home from the hospital, um, I knew this was not my home. So I was like, who are these crazy Italian people? <laughs> Where am I? Where's my Jewish parents? Right. Uh, and my mom literally, after I started feeling better, she had to force me to go outside and play. And I didn't want to. And she says, go out and play with the other kids. And I was like, now you got to remember, this is 1955, a Catholic mm -hmm. Italian neighborhood. And I looked at my mother and I said, I don't want to play with them they're scum and that's not even a word that I even knew at you know four or five years old right uh, but when she forced me to go down the soup because we lived in a brownstone and I looked at the blackboard jungle that I was living in it wasn't even a blade of grass a tree nothing you could barely see the sky between the buildings and I remember looking up and back on the on the street and I said we not we weren't made to live like this i just intuitively knew that mm -hmm. and when my sisters came out to play i started laughing and they were like why are you laughing and i said because this already happened we're already old ladies somewhere else sitting on a porch laughing um it's like i knew about time and space i i came back with all this information that no little girl in an italian catholic neighborhood a should know plus i came back with my intuitive gift of knowing mm -hmm. so i remember uh going up to one of my mother's girlfriends and pointing my little finger in her face and saying i didn't know about sex i was only a kid uh but i looked at her and i pointed my finger at her and i said you want to kiss my daddy don't you <laughs> well that was my first psychic delivery and I got my first flying lesson at the same time because I got yeah, slapped okay. across the face went sailing across the room but I knew everybody's business in the neighborhood that I had no business in knowing who was stealing from who who was doing this and doing that which terrified the old Italian ladies in the neighborhood so when I used to come home from school for lunch or whatever, they would duck into their apartments because they called me the Mala Christiana, which means the Antichrist. Um, I tried to stay normal, you know, try to have a normal, normal life uh, and put it away. Uh, but when I was 17, strangers would come up to me no matter where I was 
and they would just tell me to my face, Mar you have a gift, you have to use it. And they'd just walk away. Mm -hmm. They'd pass me little little messages on pieces of paper while I'm in a restaurant or something with messages and whatnot. And I, I hated that because I wanted to be normal, okay? Uh, but by the time I was 29 and I had my son, there was no stopping it. It was full blast all the time. And I said, okay, since I am right on the cusp, I came in on the winter solstice. So I got the Sagittarian fun part and I got the Capricorn smart part. So I put them together and I said, well, if this isn't going to go away, I need to find a way to make a living with it. Right. And that's when I started learning about Tarot. And, you know, of course, by then I had read all of Edgar Casey, like most people do. Uh, and I put it all together. And that's how my life took off. You know, uh, religion didn't do it for me. You know, I tried many different religions and I was like, yeah, none of this fits. Mm -hmm. And then through happenstance, if you believe in happenstance, I don't. Um, I met Sunbear. What's that? <laughs> right. And I met Sunbear and learned about the medicine wheel. And that felt right because I was already an environmentalist. I was already mm -hmm. doing some spiritual teaching. I was already doing hands-on healing. Um, once I got to Arizona, I became a Reiki master. So I do that too. Uh, but Native American spirituality was the only thing that made sense to me. And what was the that's more of that that, that, act, that made such deep sense to you. Well, when you realize that, first of all, the first time I saw a medicine wheel, which is a circle of stones, I'm sure, well, you've been to Sedona, so I'm sure you've seen a few. Uh, my knees started shaking. And I just naturally started crying. And I knew I was home. For me, the medicine wheel is everything. It represents everything. And it's a portal. You create an actual portal to other dimensions through it. But the main message of the medicine wheel is to recognize and respect our interconnectedness to all living things. We are all related. Right. So, you know, they would say, uh, I forget how to say it in native in native tongue, mitaka yu, oh, yes, then. All right, but um, once Sunbear died, he had come to me in vision and told me, take the wheel to the next level. And I was already teaching the medicine wheel in New York. I was teaching it in Arizona. Uh, and slowly but surely, he showed me a simpler wheel that didn't have the exclusive feeling that only Native Americans could use it. Mm -hmm. uh, and... It's a wheel you build yourself through the acts that you do all day. Uh, so I call it the uh, the universal medicine wheel, which I have a book out. I have a, a video on how to make one. Um, I I have had the most powerful spiritual experiences inside my medicine wheel. I've done weddings in there, uh, baptisms, all kinds of you know ritual. Uh, <clears throat> If, like the name of my book, Reinventing the Wheel, I call it that, the universal wheel, tool of global unity, you really could get global unity through the understanding that we're all the same, okay? We're all made of the same mud and mud right. and, right. and earth. Well, the two uh, phrases that we open the show with, you know, namaste and in la catch. Namaste is the divine in me, recognizes the divine in you. In la catch is a Mayan phrase, and it means I am another you. And so as we reflect upon each other, right, we are able, hopefully, right. to begin to understand that relationship and, and navigate the ocean of emotion a little better so that we can find some safe harbor. Absolutely. Right. Well, it's not just that. It's it's how you live your life every day. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, what you choose to eat. Okay. Well, if you respect all life, uh, and even if you follow the religious dogma, which I don't, uh, one of the big things is thou shall not kill. But we have millions of animals every day that are killed. Right. which we don't respect in any way. Their life is a torture from birth till death. 
death is probably a relief for them. Sure. Uh, and I you keep know, I telling found an people interesting that phrase it, on that topic. There is an um, uh, interesting phrase in the Book of Mormon, it, or one of the ancillary, maybe it was one of the sub books, but there was a discussion about eating meat. And there was a piece that basically had uh, purported Jesus had said, you know, it is, it is pleasing to me that ye do not eat meat except in times of famine or extreme cold. Now that kind of makes sense. Of course. Well, you know, there's a lot of books out, and I covered it in the early years of my podcast, that Jesus mm -hmm. was, was a vegetarian. Mm. Uh, if Jesus even existed. So that's a story for another day. Uh, but there's well, somebody no like him showed up to me one day. But, but people have to understand there's no meat eating off planet. Okay. So while everybody's preparing for their next lives or their life and spirit or where, whatever place they feel they're going, there's no meat eating. Okay. Mm -hmm. The interconnectedness of animals, humans, plants, rocks, all of it. We need each other. And uh, it, took, it took me reading John Robbins' last book, I forget what it was called, maybe The Food Revolution, when I ran out of excuses. So I've been a uh, vegan now for 25 years. Good for you. And my doctors are impressed because they very rarely see anybody my age on three quarters of a century. Uh, that's not on any prescription drugs, that's healthy, uh, no disease, this, that, the other thing. Uh, it's not just about my health. That wasn't the reason I did it. You can't, first of all, I was an environmentalist before that. Mm -hmm. And then I read- well, just, uh, There's I a read consciousness it. that goes along with it. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, listen, you're eating, you're either going to choose to eat something that isn't going to block your third eye which isn't going to lock you into this dimension, this flat 3D life that we live here. Or you're going to eat something that's alive and healthy for you. Uh, and I forget, I think it was Isaac Singer who said there was no such thing as a meat-eating environmentalist. So once I got past that guilt, <laughs> once right, I got past right, that right. guilt, I said, he's right. Uh, so for me, it, it was it was about the animals, the good health. That was a, you know, a pleasant side effect. It wasn't the reason. Uh, because ever since I landed here, which I believe happened when I was four, mm. all I've wanted to do is go home. And I know this is not home. So even when I read for people, you know, they got so much going on in their life. Everybody seems to have a hole. They have a hole that no matter what they do, they can't fill it. They can't fill it with religion. They can't fill it with sex, with relationships, with food. And I tell them that that hole, that missing piece, is your knowing that this is not home. And it's that yearning for home to reconnect to all that is, your higher self, whatever you want to call it, that gives people that emptiness. Oh, I, I would totally agree with that. And I would ask you the question, when you find that interconnectedness it to me would seem that there would be an additional awareness that you are home that wherever your consciousness is in that moment is right. home oh yeah but i'm talking it's, about the home. paradox right right i'm talking there's, about there's such home. emptiness such long right. connection and then once you find it's like oh gosh this has been here all along well, if you get the privilege of uh, uh, achieving, uh, what would they call it, conscious oneness, oneness mm -hmm. with all that is, no, you realize how the, insignificant, the yeah, you just realize how insignificant uh, this world is and that nothing here is real, nothing, that it's just held together by mass consciousness. And uh, I had an experience years ago. Uh, I met this lady and she was a Scientologist. And I have no use for any religion, but every religion has a little gem in it, okay? Mm -hmm. A little something worthwhile. And yeah, she was- started there with that kernel. Right. And right. then the whole thing gets blown out of proportion. Right. 
but she had to do so many hours of what they call auditing yep. to get her license or okay. whatever. whatever Did she become a Satan? I have no, listen, I had no idea, but nobody was, nobody would volunteer. So I said, okay, I'll do it with you. And I mean, we did this for weeks. I don't know how many hours we put into this. I mean, she took me back to memories that I shouldn't even remember. Okay. Mm -hmm. She took me back to that accident and showed me things that even the, uh, the memories of my parents and everybody else that told me what happened. Uh, I, I came to some realizations and understandings that they could not have known. In other right. words, she brought me into that unconscious body. Sure. And then in one session, which is their goal, which I did not know, they take you out of body. Once you get out of your body and go out into the cosmos, you're done. Okay. The whole auditing of you is done. Okay. So we do this one day. And you can't put I the pace back in that tube. What? I'm sorry. I'm saying you can't put the pace back in that Oh, tube. no, not for sure. So one day we're there and we're doing this. I'm sitting on like an armchair or whatever. And bam, I go right out. Now, the only other time that it happened to me was inside my medicine wheel. Mm. And I go right out into the universe. I'm one with everything. Okay. And I was surprised because I've had a lot of out-of-body experiences that this was different because everything was black, but everything was in that black. Everything, everywhere. I was just part of this huge ocean of black. I knew that I was vast. Uh, and what happened was she's trying to get me out of the session. Because my body's starting to shake on the chair mm. and I'm getting really cold. She's piling blankets on me and whatnot. And I could like hear her in the distance, but I'm just like, go away. Yeah, go I'm, away. I'm, I'm, I'm happy out here. Right. right. I'm so happy here. Go away. So she finally brings me back. She was crying. That's how worried she was. And first thing when I woke up, I remember I got up, I threw the chair. And I said, this is not real. I kicked the wall and said, this is not real either. I knew none of this is real. If people could get to that point, and I know it's a hard point to get to, if they could understand that everything here is like a video game and you're just a little avatar in a video game, none of it's real. Yeah. That's what Tom Campbell says. Well. Yeah, everybody would be so much happier, so much at peace, which of course goes back to your diet. Uh, Dr. Will Tuttle has the best book out. It's called um, The World Peace Diet. Hmm. And I've had him on my show. Oh, God, must be at least 20 times. And the point is, if you're eating animals that have been mistreated, raped, inoculated, beaten, uh tortured basically you're eating the energy of that animal so if you're eating that negative energy that's what you're going to put out i firmly believe that that meat eating is what locks you into this reality so people trying to you know have a spiritual experience pop their third eye whatever it is they want to call it they have a much more difficult time because they're clogged, and I'm not just talking right. about their arteries. Clogged arteries should be the least of it. Oh, sure. Well, I, I know from my own experience, and, and this was back in the mid-80s. I was working for an aerospace company, and I had just finished reading the teachings of the Ascended Masters. Oh, I yeah, those are great. Books. Everybody should have those books, right? Oh, absolutely. Right. So I'm watching others, and... Uh, I started watching others' diets, and, and I would pay attention, especially on days that guys would eat hamburgers, and to watch their behavior and shortly afterwards, right, to see if they right. were any more aggressive. Right. And I did notice it. It was strange, and yes. yet almost because exactly. you don't right, you don't think about the energy of the animal. Well, it's like sex. Okay. Ooh, <laughs> we're going to talk about sex. Oh boy. <laughs> and I wrote us actually wrote a small book on relationships. Okay. 
everything I've ever learned about relationships in my whole life, I managed to fit into like 60 pages. If hmm. somebody would have handed me this when I was 20, man, they would have saved me a lot of sweat. Okay, so here's what I tell people, including my clients, of course. When you sleep with somebody, the least thing you should be worried about is getting a venereal disease. Because when you're sleeping with somebody, your auras, your energy fields meld. Mm -hmm. Okay, which means whatever's in that person, brain, whatever, is yeah. transferring to you through the sex act. So your bedroom, your bed, is that's a very sacred space because that's where you dream. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to have a one night stand, I tell people go to a motel. Okay, go to a motel, smudge, smudge yourself right afterwards. Uh, but people don't think about that energy and how contagious it is. Energy is contagious, well, we good think. energy or bad. Maria, we just don't think there is. You know, it's like the the other national deficit is critical thinking. Right. And absolutely. How do you find that we, uh, how, <laughs> this is a really interesting thing for me because it's a, like, even with the, uh, you mentioned Scientology becoming a Thetan, this is one of their levels, right? And Thetan is actually where we get our word Satan from. It's a Greek word. It means thinker. Right. So we are so unconscious and, and what, of our 70,000 thoughts a day, you know, maybe 5,000 of them are conscious or we're aware of the thoughts. The rest of them, you know, it's like we're running, like Lipton, Lipton says, we're running on old programming. Right. Well, that's why they call TV programs. Right. It's just television programs, people all the yeah, time. Here's how you live. Here's how you behave. Here's how you do this. Here's what you should do. Well, it's like social media. There are good things about social media. I would think social media was way better 20 years ago. The internet for a user was better 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Today, it's all crap, propaganda, fear. It's like, you know, every day Facebook will tell you who you should be mad at today. Right. What should you should be pissed off about. What you should be thinking about. Uh, and what I found was something that people thought was going to bring people together has isolated people and it's allowed the people who are the most negative to hide behind the screen and put that negativity out there mm -hmm. okay the world's got enough negativity okay it is right now it's the energy is set to negativity this is the out picturing of people's inner worlds really exactly and mother earth when you look at what's going on with the earth, holy, for holy, okay, between the earthquakes, lava flows, uh, fires, uh, floods, uh, look at California yesterday, got slammed terribly. Uh, the earth responds in kind to what we put out. Sure. So, we don't even realize that we, our physical bodies are the earth. Of course. Any little, you know, people, what kind of stone should I get? Well, you know, what kind of crystal should I get? I'm like, every rock on the planet, every grain of sand holds the entire history of the world. I mean, I like crystals and stones, don't get me wrong. They're pretty, and some of them have, you know, different uses than others and whatever hmm. people want to use. And them they have for. some very interesting effects. Right. But when people stand in my medicine wheel, which is made up of rocks, Okay, I, I've adorned it with some crystals and whatnot through the years. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have rocks that are off an old Anasazi dig. Anybody that just holds one of them in their hand flips out. Okay, just think of the knowledge and the peace that comes right. to you when you reconnect to the earth. Trees, you know, uh, bushes, flowers, plants, uh, the ocean. Uh, you know, people never say, well, I'm going to go on vacation, so I'm going to go to Detroit. Okay. Forgive me if you're in Detroit. People always want to go where there's sunshine, where there's nature, camping, the beach. You know, it's abnormal for us not to remember that we too are part of nature. Right. Today, a lot of people see nature as something that's in their way. Okay, right. something to drive through. In uh, 
you know, you remind me when I was teaching high school, I, I taught at uh, Trevor Brown here at, at several other district schools and some charter schools. Most of the kids never left the valley. They never got into the desert or the high country or, or explored nature or anything like that. Right. And after, I think I had five different teaching locations, uh, charter schools, district schools, and a residential treatment center. Mm -hmm. I wrote a business plan for my second master's degree about a holistic school and village. Right. By holistic, I mean by body, mind, spirit, planet. Right. Those are four. There's probably another, but at least that right. cosmos, right? Because there is that other side of it as well. Right. We aren't we don't provide that kind of education to no, our well, we don't provide and much parents. of an education about anything <laughs> now when i lived in the valley um i was asked to teach at the desert center mm -hmm. okay i don't know if you remember the desert center or not um up in uh, carefree it was it was close but it was it was super north scottsdale okay and they had an opening uh only one and it I was the spirit of the desert. <laughs> yeah, it was a beautiful place. Yeah. Um, the opening they had was to teach about the Anastasi that lived here mm -hmm. before white people, which fit right into my right into my groove. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I asked them if I could build a medicine wheel and make it experiential for the kids. So they had like a couple of different stations: the plants of the desert. Uh, how to get water in the desert, you know, all of the animals of the desert. And she said, well, as long as you keep it environmental and don't make it woo woo spiritual, that would be great. Okay. okay. So I made a medicine wheel and what they did every, every elementary school had a, it was a field trip for every school. And, uh, what I would do is when the kid, the kids were always wild and out of control from the minute they got off the buses. Okay? Oh, sure. They, they, but they, they, free, were never, right? they were never wild and out of control when it came around to my to my group, which really bothered the other presenters. They said, what do you do, drug these kids while they're, they're in your thing that they come out so perfect? Yeah, feel the and, I, and I said, no, I listened to them. See, the children want to be heard. Mm -hmm. And I would have them come in the wheel and I would pass around a sage stick, and which of course fascinated kids because they got something that's on fire in their hands. Sure. Uh, and then a talking stick. And I would tell them about the ancient Anasazi. And I would say, okay. We pause you... for just a second because sure. not everybody knows what the talking stick process is. Well, the talking stick is, let's see, I'll use my pen. Okay. I actually have a, a very nice, I don't know where it is now, painted stick that I would pass around. The kids really liked it with some crystals on it and whatnot. And the thing is, what, and you always meet in a circle, uh, which our houses should be round, but they're not. That's why we live in trapped energy all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but whoever's holding the stick is the only one that can talk. And when they're done talking, they pass it to the next person. So it's called a talking stick. Kids love that. Uh, and then I had a friend who would play the flute and he, he was fabulous on it. And I told the kids, all right, if you were meeting each other for the first time back, you know, 2000 years ago, this is the kind of music you'd be playing, you'd be listening to. And I'd have them close their eyes and listen. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when they, you know, when it was over, I would say, how did that music make you feel? Zen, I got to tell you. Five out of every 10 kids had a spiritual experience. One little second grader said, I felt a big spirit come and sit down next to me and is protecting me. I mean, what came out of these kids' mouths was mind-blowing, okay? What ended up happening, unfortunately, the woman who owned the land, she owned the entire zip code of Scottsdale, so she wasn't hurting for money. She decided she was going to sell it for another mall and move it to her property, which was huge. She had like a 12-car garage house, okay? Wow. The firemen would practice in her swimming pool, okay? Now I've got these kids coming to this garish 
super expensive place. And you know, a lot of kids in the Valley, they live like 20 people in two rooms. You know what I mean? Especially you know, the Mexican kids. Yeah. And I said to her, how am I supposed to teach these kids that we're saving the planet for them in this environment? And I said, I can't do this. Kids are not stupid. They could see, you know, the diggers, I call those machines, the diggers digging out the desert, taking down the cactus, whatnot. Mm -hmm. And it broke my heart. And I told the kids, I said, listen, this is your world. This is your desert. That every cactus here is yours. You have the right to say, stop cutting them down. You have the right to do this and do that. Um, and what was interesting, <laughs> her land, her land didn't have the sound of one bird or any sign of life, not a lizard, nothing, zero. So I quit and she was pissed. And she said, well, you know, you, you, you have a contract. You said, you know, you, you, you owe us and blah, blah, blah. And I said, listen, I don't owe you anything. I says, I got a contract with something a lot higher than this place. And I remember the last day I was leaving, this little girl came up and she tugged on my shirt. And she said, when I grow up, I want to be just like you. I burst out crying, of course. Oh, but I felt I did a better teaching by walking away from that than trying to pull the wool over these kids' eyes. Children are not stupid. Okay? No, they're not. Children. They're not. And adults really aren't either. We just pretend to be. And because we don't think, right? We choose not to really consider who we are, what we're doing, and the consequences of such right now, in you know we're talking about the kids being vocal and, and you saying we have the right to speak up what do you think is holding the majority because in my mind we have an opportunity especially coming out of covid where we've been you know obsessed in self-hygiene and sequestrated to where we have a chance to look inside and figure out who we are and what we're all about right many took that route a lot didn't probably more so than that didn't However, there was enough that did. Now, what do we do with that voice that comes up? How can we, how do you think that this is going to evolve to where there's a, a raised voice, if you will, across the country in this need of change of leadership, of both politics and, and corporate endeavors, for lack of a better I don't want to call them marauders, but that's basically what they've been. Well, I mean, come on, we live in a corporatocracy in America. Right. Okay. The younger generation knows they have zero to look forward to. Uh, you know, they want to blame the baby boomers. Well, we didn't all sell out, or I would be a millionaire today sure, if I did. Sure. No, and right, I wouldn't right. be busting my butt doing what I do to put out the information. Uh, you and I still do all of this. Well, how how effective do you think it's been? And, and are these younger generations prepared to not point fingers and just put their attention, intention, and interaction toward what they want to create. Well, you look at look at the younger generation. They reject societal norms. They reject the political system. They reject the money system. They, you know, there are young people who have made a fortune who are still living in one room, riding a bicycle, mm -hmm. because they don't have that uh, money craze. Yeah, they're not, a, they're not Ferengi. Now, when you look right. at even the polling now, okay, because as you said, you know, for your audience, that I do cover the news, but I cover right. the news with spiritual views and a lot of humor and a lot of sarcasm. Uh, but you when you look sarcastic, at, I can't imagine. I know, hard to believe. <laughs> uh, but when you look at the younger generation right now and you look at 18, to 45 year olds, who's got their vote? Bobby Kennedy. Okay. Mm -hmm. They reject both parties because let's face it, there are two parties of one party. They're a party for war mm -hmm. and, and for the bank. Going to war with the others, you know, trying to get things that have been. Exactly. You know, uh, so here's a man who is getting demonized by the press every day, ridiculed. Of course. Because no one will take the time, you'd say thinking, critical thinking, no one will take the time to even just listen to a 20-minute speech he gives or a five-minute speech. If you listen to this man and you see, first of all, he's a diehard environment, uh, environmentalist. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. He's an animal lover to beat the band. Okay. He's talking about peace. He's talking about all our heroes from when we were kids in the 60s. I listened to him. It's like a blend of Jack Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, Martin Luther King, a little bit of Malcolm X thrown in for, for some balance. <laughs> uh, and young people are responding to him. Latinos are responding to him because the Latinos get screwed no matter which party's in place. Black people are starting to listen to him. They've made it very clear that I think most Americans, even older people, we don't want the same old anymore. Okay. We've seen decades of, you know, the same old promises, nothing ever changes, nothing gets done. And I'm no spring chicken, but the majority of Americans today are young. They have no representation, not in Congress, not in either, you know, whether it's Trump or Biden. Well, I wonder, you know, boomers and, and Gen Zers, or millennials and Gen Zers, there's the population, because we were huge. Well, but we've been, there are more millennials than there were boomers. Okay. And every time I, because I, I do, I do meet with a lot of young people because my granddaughters are young women. And mm -hmm. they bring their friends and whatnot. And I can have some really good conversations with them. And it gives me the, you know, kind of like my finger on the pulse for what these kids yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, but a lot of them have asked me, should I go to college? And my answer is the same to all of them. No. Okay. <laughs> you're going to spend a fortune. You're going to come out. You're not going to be able to get a job. You're going to be able to support yourself, learn a trade. If you have a trade, it's going to be many, many years before a robot's coming into your house to fix your plumbing or your electric. Mm -hmm. uh, learn something where you could be independent, work for yourself. You know, we were seduced, my generation, we were seduced into the job mentality. Oh, I, my, my dad worked for General Motors for 38 years, retired, tried to, you know, I said, go to work for a good company, retire. You know, exactly. Find that. Old and, and, and then you're out the just, door. Work. But you know, I remember as a child, everybody in my neighborhood owned their own business or worked for themselves. My dad had a barber shop. Uh, my girlfriend's father, he had a vegetable store. Another one's father, he had the pork store. Or another guy was selling, you know, chickens. We used to actually pick out live chickens and they'd kill them right in front of you. Uh, Everybody had their own and knew that they could have their own. They could work their way out of poverty right. at that point in American history. That no longer exists. So they came along, come work for us. We'll give you health insurance. Mm -hmm. We'll give you perks. We'll give you, you know, quarterly raises. We'll, you know, sweeten the pot, you know, a car, whatever. And we all fell for it. But then when you got to a certain point, as you can see over the past 20 years, they started taking away all those benefits and you're getting paid bupkis. Okay. Um, so yeah, we, we have to get back to, because we will eventually become a trade society. We will have to go back to trade. I think a resource economy is fairly practical, don't you? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, this money thing doesn't work unless you're in the top 1%. The money thing doesn't work. It doesn't make anybody happy. Mm -hmm. Everybody's bitching over raising you here in Arizona. Right. And angry people can't January, be cool. Yeah. And look, January, oh, the minimum wage is going to be $14.36. Yeah. Okay. But minimum rent is $2,000 a month. Yeah. You know, teach our kids that math. They don't teach them that math in school. Mm -hmm. They don't teach them how to budget. They don't even teach them the value of money. Uh, how to garden. You know, these are things that we need to teach the next generations. When well, you get and to even a... when we had a, um, up until I want to say mid 80s, perhaps there were home ec shop right. classes, auto shop, right? Machine shop, wood shop. Well, what about Those the kind arts? Of things were available in school. Right. They aren't now. No, you had art, you had music. Right. The sad thing is that this generation doesn't and may never know the sound of the beautiful music of a real live orchestra. 
Mm. Everything is digital now. Okay, every everybody is so dependent on their digital gadgets. That's why I call them gadgets. Okay, it doesn't matter what it is. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I don't know if you saw the movie uh, that the Obamas produced, uh, "Leave the World Behind," but it shows. It's a good movie. It shows how lost humans will be if we get hit with an EM, uh, EMT or a microwave we uh, weapon and all your gadgets don't work. A grown man, he can't find where he's going in his car. He's so dependent on GPS, okay? Kids today don't know how to read a map, okay? If I see somebody pull out a paper map, I immediately figure that their IQ has to be 180 or above, okay? <laughs> Uh, right. They can't tell time unless it's digital. They don't know how to change money. Yeah. Okay. Well, I remember an old friend. It, I think you even knew Willie Whitefeather. Oh, I love Willie. Willie. I took know. his tour through the desert. I yeah, loved it. Man, you know, and, and he used to teach. Well, here's how you tell time, right? You put your fists in, from right. the horizon to the sun, and that's what time it was. I learned so much about the desert from him that when I was living on the open desert, uh, which I know hard to believe it was open desert at Shea and 124th I know. Street. I know. Uh, I would I would take my wheel students through the desert, walking towards uh, Apache Point, the the mountain on uh, well, it's on Shea towards Fountain towards Fountain Hills, and I would teach them everything Willie taught me in that day. It was like my mind went into like, and I don't have a photographic memory, but I got a damn good memory. Right. And I would just take them through. Because if something happens and your trucks are not running and your grocery store is closed or, you know, my town, if the internet goes down, you can't buy anything because everybody's cash registers are down. <laughs> but Mother Earth is serving a six course meal every day. And people just walk past it and stop. Right. Yeah. So for me, it was very fascinating. Wow, what a, what a blast. What a blast from the past, Willie Whitefeld. Oh, yeah. He, he, I hadn't heard from him for years. I had him on my, my early shows uh, in 1990. I think he was my second guest, Kai D. Yeah, that sounds about right. Guess. That's about the time yeah. I met him, 1991, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, he yeah, was like the in Oldfield Ghost Town at the time. He and used he, to teach by the Superstition Mountains. Yeah, yeah, he had his teepee on Goldfield Ghost Town property. Uh -huh. um, it, was, it was just a really, so he, it'd been 20 years since I talked to him. I knew he had this book, you know, um, Desert Survival Guide for Chip, for Kids, or Kids Devil, or Kids uh -huh. Desert Survival Guide, I think it was. And uh, so I went to the website. Got a hold of the webmaster and, and just, you know, said, hey, I'm trying to get a hold of Willie. He didn't happen to know where he might be. A week and a half later, I get a phone call. Oh, CEO, brother. That's how they <laughs> blow in. That's yeah. They blow in whenever they feel like it. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that and, was really uh, cool. He uh, had said to me at that time, I was in my mid-40s, he said, you know, in our tradition, you can't join or form your own council until you're 51. Mm. And I found that bit of wisdom profound. Well, you know, you've got to kind of grow into yourself. Then you exactly. got to get past yourself. And right. then you have to be yourself. And and, he's usually got grandkids too. So there's some multiple, you know, the, the grandfather. And it's like the old Hopi and, you know, and the Pleiadians that came and taught him how to grow blue corn and, and smoke tobacco. Right, taking grandfather's spirit in and using that to help purify their being. Uh, we don't even consider that, you know, and we have no clue. And it's just an addictive behavior now. Well, my teacher Sunbear, I remember when we were doing a three day uh, a three day workshop with him up in upstate New York, mm -hmm. and he comes out during the break, and everybody that was smoking immediately put their cigarettes behind them. Well, try to eat them, right? And he started laughing. That's children, right? All right. And he said, listen, whatever you're going to do, do it with gusto. He says, you want to smoke, smoke. He says, here's the thing. That smoke has always been used to carry your prayers to spirit. Right. 
every time you smoke a cigarette or whatever, he said, say a prayer. He says, you're either going to be smoking a lot less or praying a lot more. And the only thing he asked was that we don't, you don't leave your butts on the floor. Mm -hmm. He, he never, he never presented himself as anything, but just a regular guy. Okay. And he'd say, you don't need to impress me. I'm just another goofy trying to figure things out just like you are. But when that man started to speak, I was expecting and expectations is another word that should go in the garbage. But, uh, right. I was expecting it was going to be pure spiritual stuff, you know, three days of that. Yeah. But what he ended That's up not doing, the native way. No, what he did is he talked about politics. He talked about the environment. He talked about his visions, this and that. I was blown away. I said, how, how could he, how could he know and cover all of this? And I remember he said, the student always takes on the gifts of the teacher. And after it probably was 10 years into my podcast that I never intended to do, which is now in its 24th year, uh, one day I realized that I was doing exactly what Sun Bear was doing. Because like you said in the beginning of the show, I cover politics. I cover the environment. I cover well, yeah, why not? spirituality. Why I, I, so. Yeah. We should be curious about it. Right. To me, listen, I've been that way my whole life. I want to know everything about everything. Okay. And if people think your education stops when you leave school, you're never going anywhere. Okay. Uh, I just introduced myself in meetings. I said, hi, I'm Zen and I'm an edgeholic. Just to see what kind of response I would get. Right. It's like, edgeholic, what the hell is that? Hmm? What's your answer? Gotta know. I'm curious. I've got an insatiable curiosity to know stuff. Look, my and summer vacations when I was a kid, I spent in the library all day. When it was dinner time, my mother would tell one of my sisters, go get your sister in the library. You know, I, even when I couldn't really read, I would just get stacks of books mm -hmm. and put them on, in a booth and sit there and just flip through the pages, you know, look at the pictures, try to make sense out of it. Well, and according to some schools of thought now you don't even need to read the book you just have to have it in your energy field well i will say that edgar casey who was basically illiterate mm -hmm. he memorized the bible by sleeping on it so yeah. you know you have to realize on this planet we're so limited our technology is joke compared to what exists in other places. Even if you go back to ancient Atlantis, Mew, they had things that people couldn't even dream about today, okay? The problem was they overdid it, blew themselves up, which is a good chance we could do the same because humans, you know, don't seem to learn. Yeah. Uh, but I'm for me, not. well, to me, hope is a useless, is a useless word. Uh, but when you look at the disconnect, people today are so disconnected from spirituality. Okay. I like my little town. We've got a lot of haters in this town. We've got a lot of, you know, red hats in my town. Mm -hmm. But every Sunday, the churches are full. But as soon as the church empties out, they go right back to being the same nasty people they always are. Right. But they've been absolved for the last... Right. Right. Oh, yeah. You were, uh, I'm, I'm at the papa and all the rest and the mamas and the papas. But for me, spirituality is the choices you make from the minute you wake up to the minute you go to bed. Because a lot of people will ask me, Zen, they'll say, you cover such horrific topics, you know, you, such terrible news, this and that. How do, you, how do you sleep at night? First of all, I start my day with gratitude and the Reiki principles. Um, I take care of myself physically, you know, there's not hardly a day I don't go to the gym and get my exercise and mm -hmm. don't eat, you know, every day, try to eat as right as I can. Uh, but when I get in bed at night, how do I end my day? That's when I send out my long distance Reiki to people that have asked me for it. So if you start your day cursing your alarm clock, you're going to have a crappy day. You think? It's just simple. Today sets tomorrow. Right. You know, and I tell people that 
two votes that actually matter. You vote with your money and you vote with your fork. Because I've covered stolen elections since 2000, so there's nothing new under the sun in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you look at America, one thing I've always known about this country is it was founded on genocide. And a nation founded by genocide can only end the same way. So when you look at their attempt to have killed us all, especially seniors that they were pushing to take those shots first, there was no way in hell I was taking those shots. Yeah. Okay. We seniors are a threat to this uh, system. Okay. This corporatocracy. Why? Because number one, we're smart. Number two, we actually know our rights. We were taught that. We took civics in school. Right. We've lived through most of the history they're trying to change now, you know. Uh, so the sooner they can kill us off, since they think we're useless feeders, uh, the happier they'll be. So my thing is, I want to teach as many young people everything I know before I go. Okay, I want to leave behind little clones of me. Okay. Uh, and what's interesting is, my granddaughters, like I said, they're, they're grown women now. They're not little kids anymore. Uh, but my 26-year-old granddaughter, uh, and I don't do holidays, but I always give them something, you know, usually cash, mm -hmm. because they do holidays, and I won't, I don't want to be part of that. Uh, all she wanted was one of my used decks of tarot cards, the one that I've used the most. Ooh. So I broke out a new deck for myself, which I'm getting to know, and uh, packaged it up for her. Well, and that's she the way was to pass thrilled, it on, right? Right. And she was thrilled to death. I mean, they both have their Reiki. Uh, my older granddaughter has been a Reiki master since she's seven. Hmm. And she's used it since she was seven. Kid got hurt on the playground. She was there. When she was a lifeguard, she used it lifeguarding. Uh, to them, this is normal, okay, to understand. When I remember one day my granddaughter called me. She was, oh, I was sitting with my you, right? Was, yeah, she was like, Grandma, I was talking to my friends about Reiki, and not a one of them knew anything about Reiki. She says, how is that possible? I said, Jenna, they didn't all grow up with me as their grandmother, you know. Well, you're quite That's your job now to teach them what you know. But I find young people are much more open and way smarter than they used to be mm -hmm. and they're disgusted and they have a reason to be disgusted you know uh you look at whether you want to call it climate change earth changes it's coming from the sun doesn't matter something's going on okay so these kids look at that they look at the economy they look at the way their parents lived they don't want that life a lot of young people today don't even get their driver's license. That used to be a rite of passage. I know. Well, you've got an 18 year old that hasn't got his. Yeah, they have no interest. They don't want to have a car. They have no interest in, even in Arizona, where you need a car because there's no public transportation. They just don't want, they don't want to buy into the old paradigm. So to me, the major hope for this country, this planet, are the young people. Who, who's dying now in Gaza? Okay, it's children. Mm -hmm. The Pope called those children little Jesuses of today. Okay. Wipe out their children. Well, what's going to happen? See, men are just, the men in charge are really stupid. Let's say they kill 90% of those children's parents. Okay. Well, when those kids grow up, they're going to be looking for revenge. That's normal. Okay, that can go all the way back to Moses on that story. Right. Well, you know, they set up Isaac and Ishmael as enemies, and, and you got two brothers, and it's turned into Christianity and Islam. Which right? is ridiculous. Right. And, you know, war, war. I don't remember a time in my life where we weren't involved in multiple wars, the ones we don't even know about, okay, mm -hmm. the ones most people won't talk about. Yeah, there's a genocide going on in Gaza, but there's also a genocide going on in the well, Sudan. The big one for us was Rwanda. Right. But look at the Sudan. It's right. worse. It's worse. These are the kind of things I talk about on my news shows. 
Now, but I try yeah, to it temper is. it where people would, can handle it. What do you think it would take? Because it as let's say global citizens, planetary citizens, if you will, conscious people, it would make sense that in order to move things forward for everyone, that we take care of those worst hit areas in across the population and, and reasons, whether it's homelessness or the unsheltered to the genocide, all, all of these things. If we don't, you know, give the people, help the people right. what they need, the food, the clothing, the shelter. Right. It would, it would be a lot less minimal expensive. health care at that point. It would be a lot less expensive. There's no reason we can't feed everybody on this planet. You look at the statistics. Last night I was watching a YouTube of homeless seniors in America. Mm. More seniors now becoming homeless because of everybody doubling the rent. And most seniors are on a limited income. Uh, to do this to people that built this country, okay? It was our generation that literally built this country, created a middle class, which no longer exists. Right. Uh, the veterans, you know, people that believed in what they were doing, defending their country, uh, and put them out in the street like that, and the children that are out in the street like that. And then we have the migrants, you know, let's demonize the migrants. And then you've got Trump calling all of us vermin. Um, Jesus was a migrant. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, when I was in school, it couldn't have been, maybe it was junior high. And we had to write an essay, a story on anything we wanted. And I chose, for whatever reason, to write, what would happen if Jesus came to earth today? And I remember that because I still feel the same way as I did then in, in school. He would be killed. He'd be killed instantly. God forbid if he tried to come across the southern border. That's for sure he'd be dead. <laughs> All right. And when you tell people that there are no white people in the Bible. They get very upset. Right. But it's the truth. So let's look at it a different way. If he, let's so, you know, he's got 2,000 years of wisdom ish. Right. How might that change an approach for today? Sure. He'd have to come in with his whips, he'd have to whip them all like he did in the temple the money changes and the people selling animals you know a lot of that whipping mm -hmm. in the temple that jesus did was because they were selling animals mm -hmm. uh, i don't know how he could be accepted unless he came in and said he was uh taylor swift's brother <laughs> he'd have to latch on to somebody that's you know the new god of this world right you know that's another point that, that, that you just made is that there are so many attention getters and and they get the attention through all of, of the wow and flutter if you will right. and yet the messages are when you look at them are pretty thin and well, those that do have solid messages right. that don't go to that extent to get the attention are still only heard by few. Now, how do we change that? Well, I thought the internet would change that. Didn't. What it did was it amped up the conspiracy uh, upon us, the media, the mass mm -hmm. media, which is nothing but lies and propaganda. Well, there's uh, the other side to it. How how does how is it showing up? Because it, you know, we get that programming, we get it through the television and all that. However, there is a difference in a lot of the material that is available via the internet. We right. Learn how to search right. I think you know it's it's, right. it's like that intelligence, the critical thinking. I watch right. the keywords that dig, I need dig, to be dig. looking for. Listen, I've been doing my show for twenty four years. Do you know mm -hmm. how many people? still say i never heard of you no one's got a podcast longer than me no one still never heard of you why mainstream media wouldn't touch me with 10 foot pole sure some of what proposed to be alternative media shut me down because of my spirituality which scares the shit out of them okay because mm. i'm a loose cannon okay I won't follow a script. I mean, you're a loose cannon. Well, I love uh, that about you, Maria. I always have. You know, <laughs> you're a straight shooter. You cut to the core. 
you know, in listen, a, I came in with a really strong, like, right. I came in with a strong bullshit detector, right? You know, and I, when I had an offer uh, to sell out, basically, and they told me I'd have to censor myself somewhat. Mm. Only interview the people they wanted me to interview. Couldn't play the independent artist music I was playing because their Christian followers didn't like the words in the songs. And big bucks, share of the appetite. I mean, forget it. I would have been super world famous, which I never wanted to be. I'm not on this world. Yeah. Um, and I just told them, I said, look, you got the wrong girl. Number one, I'm Italian, I'm a woman, and I'm from Brooklyn. Censoring myself is a physical impossibility. Exactly. <laughs> if I ever had a filter, that's totally gone. Okay. Yeah. There's not enough time to spoon feed information to people. There's not enough time left. Okay. The earth is getting ready to ascend with us or without us. Okay. There's not enough time to sit and chant the OM for eight hours a day, okay? Those days are over. This is the time that we have to educate as many people as we can. Find uh, what's something I've always known is that I was here to find my soul group, educate them, first wake them up, educate them, get them ready to go home. That's my purpose on this planet. And if my soul group is smaller than a lot of other people, I don't care. I'm not here for them. Okay. I've known this since I was four. Okay. So it's a long time, Stan. Mm -hmm. So everybody that's been on my show, everybody I meet, everybody I read for, these are members of my soul group. And I truly believe that souls reincarnate in groups and they reincarnate together. Sure. It's everything's frequency oriented, the harmonics. And, and you look at the new Nazis on the earth. You don't have to look far. You got Israel, which is doing the same things to the, the uh, Semites, the true the Semites. The, the oppressed become the oppressors. You know? Exactly. Uh, United States, no bargain either. hate to say it. We're one of the worst countries on earth. So it broke my heart to realize that everything I thought this country was, was not. All you have to do is learn what our foreign policy has been like all yeah. these years. That's what happened to my dad when he, he and I had some discussions when I was in my early 30s and he actually listened and opened his eyes up a bit more and he was appalled at what he was seeing. And he was 32nd degree Mason. Huh. Very, right. you know. I maybe... often think, what would my parents think if they were alive today? They would never believe this world. There's yeah. no way they would believe what has happened since they died. So what do we do in this you know, upheaval and, and this time of unrest and, and the ability that we have to coagulate greater possibilities for ourselves. You know, one of the things, the harmonics, one thing, we can have harmony among people and planet when once we realize that it is possible and not poo-poo it all the time. I'm not saying that you do, because I know you don't. Um, the one of the things that came to me a few years ago, it's funny, it was written in um, the 50s, another short collection of, of material that uh, you may have even heard of. Wilbert Smith, he ran Canada's UFO investigation program. It was like the U.S.'s uh, Project Blue Book. Mm -hmm. He had multiple contacts, had conversations. And one of the things that they said to him was quite paradoxical. They said that, you know, time to them is a measurement in the change of entropy. Hmm. So it would seem that the possibilities exist that by finding flow, right? Finding yourself, being home and acquiescing to that divinely orchestrated purpose that we all have, which is in our genetic code and our solar frequencies, that we move into these new areas of perfected form, fit, and function in the world, if you will. And through that, find ways to collaborate, work collectively, and by doing so, create greater harmony, at least in those groups, which would tend to at least offer the possibility that it would take less time to do things. 
because there would be less entropy in that process. Right. Now, to shift, and I think you know this as well as I do, when that shift is made, it's a huge difference in, and your world changes completely. Now for you, you know, it really didn't change all that much because you were already intact, right? Right, but However, listen, we've heard it a million times. Change begins with you. Change begins with one person. Right. Uh, for me, what I do, I consider everything I do teaching, mm -hmm. but I'm always looking for a segue to drop even if it's one sentence into somebody's head that's going to make them think. Right. And whether I say it sarcastically or as a joke, uh, because it's how you say it to whether or not people will respond. Oh, absolutely. Uh, so I'm always, and it doesn't matter who it is. It could be the checkout girl at the supermarket. It could be the guy on the bike next to me at the gym. My ears are always peaked to hear what are people talking about? How can I, how can I slide in there? Yeah, and not just what they're talking about, how they are talking about it, because that's your that's their emotional place from which right. you can actually right. engage. Right. I mean, earlier you asked, you know, have we made a difference? You know, all these years of banging our heads against the wall. The truth of the matter is surprising to me. It's only taken since 1995 for people. Most people now acknowledge chemtrails. Right. Where before they didn't. Okay. Uh, more people now are understanding how corrupt our governments are. Okay. Uh, and you see the protests, you see what's going on. Sure. Um, so it's kind of like you're in a quandary because you want to participate in life, but you don't want to participate in the madness they create that they oh, yeah. want you well, like you tell somebody hey you really ought to listen to oliver stone's interviews with vladimir putin you right. have your eyes opened right and you know my wife being from russia um and, and knowing what state of affairs it was in prior to the breakup and then when putin stepped in he's rebuilt the country it's gorgeous now we've there's several uh people that she watches that Rome, Russia, and just watching them. I mean, this is live stuff. You can't make it any more real. Listen, I don't know of one nation on the face of the earth that has a person in charge that really cares about their people. Mm. Can't name one. You know, I, I do like Lula da Silva, but like all of them, they make promises they can't keep or won't keep. Okay. That's uh, often due to the people they have around them, though. Exactly. They have good intents, but there's that, you know. Well, we really need, and I've said this so many years in a row, we need, every government needs an enema from top to bottom, a redo. Well, that's what I was asking earlier. What can we do to raise the voice, collectively figure out how to organize and find or recreate another party that can replace the other two. Well, Not that it's and vote, you know, vote, vote independent. It's simple. I've been voting independent for 25 years. Uh, I will not be a party of the two party system. Mm -hmm. They're not, I won't support that. Whether our vote counts or not is irrelevant. Obviously, it didn't in 2000 when the Supreme Court gave it to Bush. Mm -hmm. It probably won't count this year either. Uh, but who really changes the world? Think about it. Artists, poets, philosophers. That's what we need. Those types of energy in charge, not the people we get. Right. So we need to flush them all out, vote them all out, try to get as many women in power as you possibly could get because men has proven they can't to handle the job. <laughs> uh women born to multitask well and they're uh, used to taking care of families too what they're used to taking care of families yeah they're they take care crazy. of their family they have run a job they take care of the house i mean they were kind of, and it's supposedly a woman's brain is made to multitask where man isn't hmm. now there are differences between men and women besides below the yeah. way mars and venus right all right mars and venus that guy <laughs> 
I don't even want to talk about that stupid book, but it has some good points in it. I'll give you that. It had some good points in it. Well, we are. You know, we are different, and yet we both have masculine and feminine energies within us, and it's the balance of those that we require. Exactly. Not necessarily in physical form, right? It's just, the, right. again, it's that personal choice to internalize and balance right. one's energy. Well, I know, when I'm, I know when I'm using my masculine energy. Mm -hmm. you know, it's usually when I'm working. Yep. You know, when, I'm, when I'm producing, when I'm doing my show, that's my masculine energy. My female energy comes into place in my sessions with people because she's a loving little funny little girl who gives people happy little direction and advice, even in the worst situations, right. because I love them. Okay. And that's what's missing. We don't hear anybody anymore talking about peace or love. In the 60s, that was a big thing, but they put us all down and, you know, Timothy Leary came along as a, you know, a client of the government to drug everybody out uh, and forget about peace. Uh, but we're not put on this earth to suffer. We came here to have a good time. And I don't know too many people that are having a good time. You know, when I, when I used to be on the road lecturing, I, I would start the lecture with asking the class, the room, if they were happy. Nobody could answer that question. And then when I would say, when's the last time you were happy? They couldn't remember. Didn't matter if they were wealthy, if they were, you know, middle class, if they were poor. People have forgotten to be happy. You know, it's just the treadmill of life and, you know, do what you're told to do. Hate who you're told to hate. Right. Pay your taxes. and so uh, What's the... We're kind of getting close to time, and I think that this is a real good point to offer an out, right? How can you be happy? What What's it take from a internal and external combination to at least be open to that door of happiness? Well, start your day by saying, just for today, I choose to be happy. If you have people in your lives that all they do is call you on the phone and bitch and moan, just, I had to do this with my own mother, Zen, and I wish I would have done it sooner because she was a real Sicilian, always, always in a mood. One day I said to her, Ma, I'm having a happy life. If you can't add to my happy life, don't call me. And she never called bitching again. So you need to also eliminate the negatives. Set boundaries. Right. So learn to set boundaries, eliminate the negatives, find out the things that you like to do that make you happy. Okay. Uh, do something for somebody else in need. That that can make you happy. Uh, some lady wrote a book years ago, 10,000 Things That Make Me Happy. It was just a list. Mm -hmm. By the book, there's 10,000 things. There's something in there that's going to make you happy. Uh, you know, if, uh, I don't know, eating a pizza makes you happy, have that pizza and ice cream, whatever it is, you, whatever floats your boat. Uh, but what about the lasting space, happiness though? Lasting happiness only comes from the knowing it's from spiritual knowing and you have to, uh, and I always tell my listeners every day, whatever your spiritual program is, work it harder because Happiness is an inside job. It's not going to come from outside. It's not going to come from your husband, your wife, or, you know, tickets to, uh, I don't know, to a show. Happiness is inside. Uh, and, and protecting yourself, right, and choosing to be happy, you know, uh, and protect yourself. Put a protection around yourself every day because, like I said earlier, there's a ton of negative energy around us at all times. So I've got big medicine wheels around my house. I know they create a different energy, you know, chimes, uh, little statues of angels, you know, this, that, whatever Something makes you happy and brings in good energy. Go to right? that place, right? And bring and, and, in good energy and don't yeah. allow, don't allow anybody negative into your space. And if, you know, sometimes you can't help it, say, you know, your mother-in-law shows up. Once they leave, just smudge the house, smudge the house, clear your energy, you know. Uh, and refuse to get caught in the trap that they set for us here. 
and just work your spirituality, whatever it is. Okay. Why is that? Uh, and work it harder than you ever did before and never let your, your guard down because when you, you have light and you're seeking light, light attracts a lot of darkness and you can't afford to forget that. That's my two cents. Cool. Maria, it's just been great to catch up. And, and I know, so it, fun. <laughs> uh, a wonderful conversation. Went a lot of different places. I really enjoyed it, and I'm sure our audience will too. It was a fun conversation. Great, yeah. Just let me know when it's posted, and I'll send it out. Let people we'll know what's up and about. I'll do so, and I'll have the information about you, your podcast, and maybe some of the books you mentioned below the video it's is all there it's all on my site they could surf surf away but i'll tell you what it's better than a college education i mean i've done about six thousand shows i keep about 800 hours on site because those are the ones that give you the full education very good so. we'll have that link there and thank you again so much my pleasure uh Namaste and in luck catch. And thanks for sticking with us for this episode of One World in a New World. I'm Zen Benefil, your host, and I will see you next time.